Hello, hope you guys are well. Welcome to this week's podcast. This is early Saturday evening. I've just finished editing part one. That's right, part one of the podcast. And I thought I'd come on and just tell you that this week's going to be in two parts because we got so much in, we recorded for nearly two and a half hours. So instead of making you sit through two and a half, two and a half hours, I've decided to split it into two. So without any further ado, here's part one. Hope you enjoy. So hello and welcome to this week's photography podcast. I think we're on episode 43 now. And uh, well, you know, we've our guests have been fantastic so far. And we've got another really, really good guest tonight, I have to say. Um, He's a, he's a bit of a he's a bit of a superman really. He's a, he's a gallery owner. He's a professional photographer. He was he's the winner of the Landscape Photography of the Year Classic View in 2018. He's had loads and loads of commended things. There's only one negative I can think about him, and that's that it's rumored he's a Liverpool fan. But other than that, he's he's right up there. So I'd like to welcome to the podcast this week Stuart McGlennon. Hello. Hello. Hey, How Stuart. Doing, mate? What a what an entry. Yeah, quite quite an interesting. Are you a Liverpool fan? I am a die-hard Liverpool fan, and I'm in a world of pain at the moment. (laughs) World of pain. That's what I was saying. Even when I was going to give it as a negative, I thought actually I feel quite sorry at the moment because you're really struggling. None of these guys talk football. I have to say. All right, okay. Yeah, this is this is just me and you. So, (laughs) so how are you? You good? Not so bad, not so bad, yeah. yeah, all good. Been out for some photography today and, uh, yeah, just ticking along. How did that go? Uh, not good, not good. <laughs> it was uh, pretty cloudy. Uh, just saying to you guys, before I come on, i been to Buttermere a couple of days ago and had this lovely cloud inversion and thought, yeah, mm. onto a winner here, going to get loads of good pictures. And the mist never shifted, basically. Sat there for about three hours waiting for it to move and by the time it did, the sun was way too high in the sky and you know it was a bit of a bust so i came back this morning and the forecast again was uh clear skies frost and it was ended up 70 percent overcast and gray and yeah weather forecasting though i can never get a decent weather forecast anywhere these days to be honest with you i I noticed that about you guys i noticed my clear outside last on monday i checked it and it said fog on tuesday and then literally after Tuesday, it had just given up. There was no, there was nothing mm. where the fog was. I noticed so, that. Yeah, that's the one I normally use. Yeah. And it, yeah, no, I noticed it was that. I miles there was, a, off. there was a bug on it or something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I thought they just, they just couldn't, they couldn't be bothered this week. We're just okay. not going to, we're just not going to bother guessing. No they were fog. miles off today. Miles was off. I think that was actually a topic that we were going to discuss one day. Is particular weather apps that we use, perhaps on our phone or websites that that we that we go on as well i mean i mean i use clear outside and i use uh the met office but obviously because i don't venture to the mountains that much uh well i haven't been for a year but i know that the what's it called is it the m w i s mountain weather information something service, information I mean. yeah that's it yeah that's the one you use isn't it isn't it dave Oh, well, my MWIS is my window information service. <laughs> <laughs> That's as good as anything normally. Just just look out the window, see what it's doing and, and crack on. Yeah. Now, what, what is the one that you do use, Dave? You, you know, do it use... is. It's mountain weather. It, it's, it's Met Office, but it's very, very specific. Yeah. It, it, it'll, it'll, well, in, in Snowdon, I think there's 26 peaks that they give the... Uh, the weather forecast for at different elevations. Yeah, that's it, yeah. It's crazy. I remember you saying to me before about that, Dave, and I guess you two guys both living in where you do, in Snowdonia in the Lake District, we don't really realise it, but I remember going to Snowdonia for a holiday uh, photography thing a couple of years back, and I'm going to I'm gonna butcher this, Dave. F- Finelli? Finelli? That's the one. Yeah. 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 You say that whether I get it right or wrong. You say, yeah, that's right. <laughs> every, 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 week, yeah. Yeah. every week Dave agrees with you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we stayed there anyway, and that's a, about seven miles outside of Lamberis. And it was a, must have been four or five degrees warmer. You drive into the mountains, there's only snowing. It was like a spring day. 20 minutes later, you're driving, it's snowing. It's crazy. So I can see why you'd need those specific and specialist Very weather localized. apps. localised. Yeah. I found that as well when I went to um, to the lakes one year. Um, I it was in Coniston where we were staying. Um, 
it was it was the weather wasn't too bad um but i went on my own to uh blee tarn not to actually the tarn but to walk up one of the fells there yeah and uh, the the weather really kind of clagged in it was you know it was really not nice weather so because i was because helen was back in coniston i thought oh do you know what I'm not going to spend too long here. I spent like about three hours there, but I came down and got in the car and I drove back to Coniston. And as I was driving to Coniston, the sky was changing. And by the time I got to Coniston, it was like beautiful and sunshiny. And I said, to, you know, to Helen, oh, I said, you know, look, the weather's changed now. So come on, let's go back out. And we went back to Blee Tarn, but it was all clagged in still. <laughs> and I don't know what the difference Sounds for the miles right. is. The mile is probably only... Well, I don't know what ten miles difference between if that. The, 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 yeah, if, if that yeah. between the two if destinations, that. and it, it was unbelievable that the, the weather systems were were so different. It, uh, that were, you know, that were so close together. I think that's all to do with the mountains, though. They just kind of hold it, don't they, in the valleys? Yeah. And, um, Especially where I, I I live close to the the coast here. Well, I say close to the coast, on the coast, and a lot of the photography i do is in the sort of wasdale Eskdale area and it's some of the biggest mountains are there but it's very close to the close coast so it's probably i don't know maybe five six miles and you know it can literally change in 10 minutes you know it can go from flat yeah. calm to 20 mile an hour wind and you know you end up chasing your tail a lot of the time yeah yeah but i suppose that as well that is the beauty with the mountains though isn't it because all of a sudden the weather can change and you get that beautiful kind of burst of light come through that just uh, that can that can make or break an image yeah yeah definitely it's very very changeable it's you know i mean i did a vlog the other day i don't know if you'd seen it that uh, you know it was absolutely pouring down but uh, yeah, I saw you know that. It, it is like that a lot of the time it's very changeable very rainy you know you just got to just got to get on with it really I guess the bonus is though is that you know it might be raining one minute, but at least I mean here in in where we live in East Anglia, if it's raining, you that's it normally it's set in for hours, aren't you? But yeah. at least with um, you know somewhere like the lakes or Snowdonia, it's that changeable that you can hopefully get some decent weather at some point during the day. Yeah, oh, yeah. I, and I know because I, I I mean I've said this before and I've said this actually on some of my vlogs, and I think people just feel that I'm a bit of a a hater when it comes to East Anglia. And I know that East Anglia has got a, a lot of beauty, you know, but, you know, for photography, I'd much prefer to be in the mountains. But that's the thing, because obviously we've got no peaks around here, that when the light kind of does change, it like for a fleeting moment, it doesn't really affect the landscape too much because you, you know but it, it, there's nothing got, for it to bounce off exactly so when you're in yeah. when you're in the mountains yeah exactly you've summed oh, it up beautifully someone's shaking their head look at that embrace oh. the friends dad come on you're living oh, in it now just my. embrace the beauty oh. of it I oh, know I've embraced the open of those big skies, you know, just embrace it for what it is. <laughs> yeah. I've I've embraced it for a year, Jay. I, I I need to I need to get away from the big skies. Yeah, fair enough. I, I need little skies, tiny, <laughs> tiny little skies. <laughs> and Massive big, mountains, tiny skies. Mountains, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Before we go on, we should we should comment that you might notice we've got one missing at the moment. James oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Is it? yeah we had, I, I did wonder whether you were going to mention it, but so I thought I'd better do so. So, yeah, James is hopefully going to join us, but not 100% sure whether he is. He sent a message earlier on to say he could be a bit late. So, yeah, you've only got five. So we haven't we haven't sacked him off as well and replaced him permanently with Stu. Yeah. <laughs> he is welcome back whenever yeah, he wants. Not yet, anyway, not yet. No, not yet. Yeah, yeah. Not yet, no. <laughs> we'll see how Stu goes tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Not that he'd want to. I mean, could you imagine? Oh, every week with us guys. Oh, no thanks. I mean, all I have to do crack, it, you know. Good crack. Yeah. I, yeah. I watch every one of your episodes. It's really, it's really enjoyable. It's uh, it, what you guys do. It's no, it's really good, really good. Well, in all fairness, it's what it's what it's what Gary does. Really, we don't. We just turn up and, and have a <laughs> chat, and then leave it all to Gary. Really, he yeah, seat. he does. He flatters yeah. us. Yeah, he really does flatter us. <laughs> even, even though I'm not trying to, really. I'm trying to make you look bad. I'm trying to make myself look good and you look bad, but it just never seems to work. It's always the same. The, the trouble is, dude, he's got so many outtakes of stuff that's never made the podcast that yeah. so we can never afford to upset Gary because he's got so much ammunition on us now that he could easily share stuff that we just... I, I, take it, I take it there's going to be a compilation, bloopers, 
whatever coming. Depends how much they point. pissed me off, didn't it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Depends how much they upset me. We, we, there were, I have to say there were several times, probably, how many have we done now? 40 odd. There must have been at least 20 times when we're chatting afterwards and we're going, we have stopped recording, haven't we? <laughs> yeah. We're not recording anymore, are we? No, you're, like, no, you're safe, we're not recording. That, that's that's some effort though, that, 40 episodes. Wow, that's uh, that's pretty impressive. I think what's more impressive is people still tune in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's quite nice when no, we don't release, you know, people do actually comment saying, oh, I missed the podcast this week, which is a uh, fair play and thank you ever yeah. so much. Yeah. Well, no. While we're on that subject as well, um, subscribers to the channel, the podcast channel on YouTube, doesn't seem to correlate with our views. So it means a lot of people are watching the, the podcast or listening to it on the podcast and not subscribing to the channel. Now, obviously, it's completely their prerogative to do so. But, yeah. you know, if you are watching on YouTube and you haven't hit that subscribe button, maybe do so now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's completely up to you and it's your own decision. Yeah. We're not going to hold it against you. But if you haven't subscribed, we hate you. <laughs> oh, 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 Jay, Jamie done such a good job then and you yeah, came yeah, in like, really like a wrecking that, ball that was seamless wasn't it that was seamless. I learned from the master yeah. Stu yeah. <laughs> so, um, so I tell you what let's get on to some subjects shall we um, let's talk let's start off by talking about printing and framing because we've got the perfect person here to talk to about this because you've got your own well you know you've got your own gallery haven't you in, in Keswick isn't it in Keswick, yeah, 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 and so I'd imagine you do an awful lot of printing, either by either yourself or through a third party, and an awful lot of framing. Yeah. So, you know, I know Darren. I know you think that that printing is one of those things that people just don't do enough. I love it. I know, you know, from somebody like me, you know, who's just a, a hobbyist, I can understand why people don't print because it is an expensive hobby. Yeah. But I just love it. I just love holding that print in my hand and not only that I when I when I look at <laughs> my prints sometimes I can see glaring mistakes <laughs> that I didn't see on yeah. the computer screen and when I say yeah. glaring not glaring but there might be something on that print that I just thought oh you know I just didn't realize so it kind of then you go back and you just get rid of it and tweak it then you'll hold a hard copy and yeah, yeah I, I love it no, there's nothing quite like it. Do you do uh, sort of use different paper types, or do you just stick to the one paper? Or? I use I use Photospeed, um, and I do like Permajet's paper. Actually, I like uh, Permajet FB Distinction. If it's like a burrito, I can't tell the difference between Permajet's FB Distinction and uh, Photospeed's Premium Burrito. Um, yeah. And if I'm going to use that paper. And then I use a, a flat mat, like an NST bright white, something like that. That, that NST is the one I... Well, I, I did a video on printing a little while ago, and I, I use probably... I'd say about 70% of the stuff actually just gets done on smooth pearl, which is like a sort of... Yeah. I wouldn't say it's a budget paper, but it's a, it's a good all-rounder uh, in terms of sort of performance against cost, because obviously running a, a business, I've got to look at the cost issues as well. Of course, and, yeah. When you when you've got people coming in the gallery um, who you know perhaps aren't photographers and aren't uh, sort of clued up on you know all these different paper types, they can't really tell the difference. Do you know what I mean? See, so mm. you you do feel like you're maybe chucking money away a little bit on the more expensive stuff, but uh, but yeah, it, I mean, you were saying before about you know not enough people do it. And it's I'd highly recommend it to anyone. I mean, th there's nothing like you, like you say quite like seeing the final sort of print on, on paper. It just gives you a different perspective than looking on a monitor. I mean, the problem with monitors is that it's, you know, it, it feeds into this sort of psyche of you need more megapixels and you need to see more detail and all that sort of stuff. But when you actually print, you know, it's amazing how much you can actually get away with in a, in yeah. a print. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Uh, one of the, the prints that uh, I've got of Mark Littlejohn's in the gallery at the minute is... Uh, He'd hate me for saying this, but if you look at the file up close on a computer, it's it, it's a bit iffy, partly because it was shot off an old Pentax camera about maybe 10 years ago, something like that. But when it gets printed up and it's printed on the right paper, using the right profiles, and you know it's a paper that's sympathetic to that type of picture, you can get away with it a little bit. Do you know what I mean? And, and when you stood 
two and three feet away from it, you can't see a, a lot of those little sort of niggly things anyway. Do you know what I mean? A lot of it's about viewing distance. Yeah, I remember Paul Johnson saying on the photo nerds about printing, and uh, he was saying it's similar to, he was comparing it to to uh, painters of the past. That You don't go and stand at a painting and look at it there and go, yeah. oh, I can see that brush strokes a bit out there. You're looking at it at a distance, and I think that's the difference between printing and screens. Like you say, with screens, we're, we're always looking, almost looking for something to be wrong. Yeah. We're focusing yeah. in on that and zooming in, whereas when you're looking at an image, a pick a printed image, you're appreciating the whole image and, and you're not pixel peeping and no. looking at that. You're just looking at that's really nice. And I printed some stuff out to, uh, yesterday or the day before. Uh, I actually sent off, the, I use, I don't know, I use Loxley Colour for a lot of my stuff, but I was, I've was i got a printer of my own. And I'm not very, really, it's not a great printer, but I printed a few bits and pieces out of it and looked and thought, they look so different from the screen yeah. so much different yeah. brings other things in it's it's fantastic mm -hmm. yeah 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 i, don't know it, I mean you, go on you go no i was gonna say Stu, i don't know about you but i mean uh, how how often do you look at your image on your on the screen and when you press print do you normally get it right first time every time or is there a few different tries before you know you're happy with the actual print uh, I think before I started doing sort of, I wouldn't say mass printing, but sort of more printing than I was before I owned this gallery. Um, yeah, there was a bit more trial and error, I think. Uh, but of, certainly over the last three years, I've sort of obviously just trial and error experience or whatever you want mm. to call it. But uh, you do sort of, you, you can see an image and just sort of eyeball it and go, yeah, that'll suit this type of paper or that type of paper. And, you know, seven, eight times out of ten, I'll get it right first time. It might need yeah. a, a minor tweak, but, I mean, the the main thing when you're doing the testing is you're not wasting ink. So, I mean, if you do sort of small little sort of four by sixes or whatever yeah, uh, and, and just look at them that way instead of doing the full print, you know, you, then you're not churning through your ink. But, uh, but no, just... I mean, certainly from a, a lab point of view, I mean, I sort of mix my printing probably about... Maybe thirty thirty percent of the printing I do, maybe forty percent, and then the other sixty gets done by the lab. Um, I spent an awful lot of time in the early days of the gallery going up to the lab, and it, it's only about an hour's drive for me, so it's fairly local. And uh, doing tests and tests and tests, and we're we're at the point now where I can just send them a tiff, and I, I don't even have to worry about it. I know what's coming back right. is uh, is going to be, you know spot on accurate but uh but yeah most of the time i would say there's not too much testing in done now i would say so what what's changed then when you said that you used to go there and you used to do loads of tests and now you send it away so what, what what's changed between then and now uh well <laughs> when you when you're printing you you want to obviously sort of match the paper type to the type of image so you know it's it's yeah. not always going to be that you're going to print every picture on a burrito or every picture on an etching or whatever. It, it depends what the scene is. So what I was doing uh, with my lab was just sort of, I would take maybe two or three really contrasty sort of punchy images and then two or three really sort of soft pastel scenes with not really a lot of contrast in them. And we would just do test prints on the different papers and just... Oh, I see, just, right, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Just just to sort of get a feel for what was going to work and what wasn't going to work. Um, but it, it, is a, it is an art. You do need to sort of practice it. Uh, if you don't, if you just do sort of casual printing at home now and again, it, it, it does take a little bit of tweaking to get it right. Yeah, I found with my kind of limited printing if you like uh, it's, it's like anything but i'm a lot better at printing now than i was say a year yeah. ago i would go through a lot more test prints than i do now i still print four thumbnails uh, on an a4 before I, I print it on an a4 or, or on an a3 but now it's more of a case of just seeing which edit i prefer whereas in the early days i'd I'd, I'd look at something on the screen and think, oh, that's going to come out okay. But it'd come out really dark, you know. And then I'd, but now I've kind of got to learn how that paper is going to react with kind of what yeah. I see on screen. So, it, as I say, it's an expensive hobby and it's an expensive learning curve. But 
for me, yeah. Uh, if, if my printer broke, I would have to go and buy another yeah, one. Yeah, it's, it's, it's never going to be a sort of... Uh, they're not really a value for money sort of purchase, really, to be honest. No. It's just it's just about completing the process and just, you know, the whole experience of photography, you know, why people, you know, use film cameras and whatever. It's it's not necessarily about, you know, it's just the, the wider experience of it, I think. So is yeah. that what it is generally? Because there's a balance between whether you choose to print your own and invest in your own printer and, you, and the inks, which are obviously the import, uh, the, the costly piece, versus sending it to a Loxley that that um, Gary does. So the balance is more swaying towards whether you want the experience to be able to actually physically yeah. have that at home and, and enjoy that experience, rather than a commercial decision on which is going to cost me less. So if you've decided that you want to enjoy it, then you have to invest in it, I guess, is what you're yep. saying. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you've got you've got to commit to it. You've got to I mean, I'm talking now from a perspective of just sort of a home user, not necessarily what I'm doing, but uh yeah, if you're gonna start doing it at home, I think you've just gotta make your peace with the fact that it's expensive. It you know, you're gonna spend a lot of money in refills and paper and But surely in just... the scheme of things, when you stack it up against say the price of a decent lens, for example you know, if people are hobbyists and they've got a bag full of kit, they're probably carrying 10K around with them. So, you know, spending £1,000 on a printer and some ink, in the scheme of it, it's it's not that bad, really, even if it is just a hobby. Mm. I think you've hit the nail on the head, Dave. Ab- absolutely. That's the thing. We all kind of think about, oh... Oh, the latest camera for I'm saying, oh, two or three grand, as you say, like of you know, dropping a grand or two grand on a, a lens here and there and our bags, you know. But and people think, oh, like printing is expensive, which you know, which it is. But I think you know, if I had the choice, I think I'd rather sacrifice one of my lenses and keep the printer because mm. at the end of the day, and what Stuart was saying, you know, you choose certain papers, um, they, they can be quite forgiving. So even yeah. if you haven't oh, got yeah. the best lens in the world, you know, if you choose the, choose the right paper, they don't need to be this pin sharp front to back and all that, you know, going back to, you know, oil paintings or, or artists, you know, as you say, they're never pin sharp. They're all soft. And so there's there's a lot of manipulation that you can do. The, the thing that I've noticed since starting that gallery is that, uh, you know, photographers really get pre far more preoccupied than they should with megapixels and dynamic range and all that sort of stuff. Because, I mean, a good example, I mean, is that a lot of the prints I sell are panoramics in the gallery because people want sort of big pictures that fill walls. And I've got a number of images where they've been shot in the sort of conventional panoramic style, which is sort of 10, 15 frames across, merge them together and spits out your panoramic and then i've got other images where they're just a, just a single crop 16 9 or whatever and they're both you could put them both side by side at a, easily a meter wide stand back from them and you would really struggle to tell which has been shot off which which has been the multi-stitch panorama with god knows how many megapixels in it and this and the single frame crop yeah. out of one image you know but and yeah, people stood by them images side by side. They they can't tell any difference. And and to be honest with you, even me who's looking at them on a 4K monitor all the time, you'd be pretty hard to tell the difference. Mm. Mm. Moving moving away from printing for a second because I'm I'm sort of dying to ask this question. Does it does it like just like kill you inside do you die inside a little bit when you hear do you, do you, hear, do you hear comments when you're in the gallery and people oh, don't like that or don't like that or that was because I would feel like these are my children all the time these are my children you're talking about here in my photos I'd, <laughs> I'd want to go out and say you don't like it cough get out of my gallery oh, no no <laughs> what's the worst no, what's the it... worst you've had what's the worst comment you've had worst one god do you know there was one incident where I mean, I, I'm I'm pretty easy going. I can, you know, just let things go. And I, the gallery window is right next to where my desk is. So people come to the window and you can hear everything that's going on outside. And they can see you sitting at the desk, but they think I can't. It's, it's, it's weird. Anyway, but uh, yeah, the worst incident I had was last 
last year, and I don't normally react to these sort of things, but uh, a lady was at the window with with a friend, and um, oh, hello, hello, hello Mr. stage Brian. left. <laughs> hello. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the, <laughs> yeah, we stopped slagging him <laughs> off earlier on, so it's fine. Yeah, so a, a lady and a friend were outside talking, and then the other two out of the group came in the gallery and were having a nosy about. And the woman stood at the the window for a good 10 minutes straight, I would say, absolutely ripping into this picture uh, in the window. And the daft thing was this picture, she was, she was sort of, she was really quite sort of deeply offended by this picture. You know, she was, (laughs) Oh, look, look at how the, the, the airbrush this stuff in and all this sort of stuff. Honestly, it was the most untouched picture you can imagine. It was just a bog standard uh, lake reflection type scene with a bit of mist drifting across and you know, just bar a bit of a contrast tweak or whatever. It had very little done to it, this picture. But anyway, she went on for about 10 minutes straight about how you know photographers are ruining pictures and this, that and the other. And um, anyway, she came in with a friend after 10 minutes of slagging this picture off and just like I'd heard nothing and uh, you know, nothing had happened or whatever. And she starts sort of moseying around, like looking, you know, what, you know, trying to show some interest in the pictures. And uh, she sort of picks one up and I said, look, I said, I'll stop you now. I said, I have absolutely no interest in selling you anything today. Oh, I well said, you've done. Stood there. I said, you've stood there for 10 minutes slagging that picture off over nothing. Um, and now you're trying to, you know, pretend like you're interested in something. And I said, just, you know, sling you up, basically. And she sort of looked at me like this, and um, and her two friends were absolutely gobsmacked. And, and I said, yeah, go on, carry on, out you go. <laughs> so anyway, off, off she went um, with the tail between her legs. But as I say, normally that stuff doesn't bother me at all. But uh, it was just, it, I couldn't have cared less about the picture. The picture doesn't bother me. It's just, It's just how just blatantly rude people can be. Do you know what Naive I mean? Naive as well. She didn't say, she didn't say like, Dave, we're off to back to Anglesey. We're never coming here again. <laughs> <laughs> it was just, she was just one of the, she was just one of these people. And you, you know the type that I'm on about who just saunter through life, sort of, you know, they'll make comments like that in a restaurant or a bar or, or something like that. And no one ever corrects them. And it's probably the first time in her life someone's actually corrected her on it. You know what I mean? But she was, uh, yeah, it was, it was funny. But you get all number of comments, and you've just got to just let them sail off your head. Because if 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 you didn't, you'd be sitting there stewing all day. But uh, yeah, well, not, you can't not please quite, everyone. Not quite the same. But I, I won't mention my friend's surname. But he has got not the best surname in in the world, and uh, Cock. he. he, he <laughs> it's and, like uh, you really want to know what it is now. Yeah. As, uh, and oh, go on, he, what is it? He, he rang up um, uh, someone and they said, oh, you know, name please. So he said their name. But whoever was on the other end of the phone obviously thought they muted him or they muted the phone call. And <laughs> you, he said, I could hear her talking to her friend going, oh, do you know what this guy's surname is? And the other one went, oh, that's horrible. Fancy being married to him. And then you have to change from a really nice surname over to that surname. And and he's on the end of the phone thinking, I can hear every bloody word you're saying. And then when she kind of came back on and said, oh, yes, you know, I'm going to transfer you or so-and-so is coming. He actually said, you know what? I heard every bit of that conversation and I can't do nothing about my surname. And it's not my fault. My name's Michael Pedophile. <laughs> <laughs> What your problem is? <laughs> yeah. But yeah, you you get people like that all the time, and you just yeah, you just gotta you know it doesn't doesn't bother me in the slightest to be honest. I thought you showed great patience. Great patience, Stu. I would have frog marched them out. I've got <laughs> I just I mean that day that I don't know whether I just had a bad day or whatever, but that that was one time. Like I say, I wasn't I couldn't care less about what, what she thought of the picture. It was just the fact that this person thought. They could just stand there for ten minutes, just being that rude without someone telling them and correcting them. Do you know what I mean? But yeah, uh, mm. but yeah, a lot of it. I just I, the, the other the sort of daft comments you get. You know, you can imagine the usual sort of stuff. It they'll come in and they'll 
oh, I've got a picture like that on my phone. Look, uh, why would I pay for that? You know what I mean? Yeah. He's just got to laugh at them. It's just funny. Yeah. I wonder why they even walk through the door, though. What If they're that way inclined, why get that far? Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I mean, always just... think that. You know, if you've got that mindset, then, you know, exactly. why why have you come in anyway? You know what I mean? But I suppose yeah. people are getting out of the rain. Yeah. There's that. There's definitely that. There's a lot of people who come in blatantly just to take shelter when it's pissing down, definitely, yeah. Is it not again, a bush shelters just... in Keswick? <laughs> no, there is. I don't think... She sell is. umbrellas, Stu. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. a good sideline. Yeah. yeah. That's a good sideline. And pack a max yeah. Put some pictures yeah. on them. I'll be honest with you, that's the only <laughs> reason I don't go into opening a gallery here in Bedfordshire. It's just the, uh, yeah, just the people coming in. The only in reason. Yeah, the only, well, yeah, the only, I haven't got anything well. decent to put in there, but <laughs> other than that, yeah, it's, it's the only reason, yeah. Oh, so what, are we going to talk about, um, we're going to talk about, do we want to, like, evolve this conversation and talk a little bit about framing? Because yeah. that's something that we never talk about, and as important as printing is, if you're going to put it up on your wall, then clearly framing's the next step, and I think maybe there's a frame... Can a frame do a lot to an image? I mean, I don't, I, I'm not a framer. I've never framed anything myself, but, you know, from someone who's a professional. Honestly, I would say it's more important than the print. Really? Uh, I, know that, I know that's going to sound mad to every photographer probably watching this, but it's the one thing that just it just doesn't get talked about enough because, you know, you see all this stuff online and you see, you know, companies like Photospeed are always putting stuff out about, you know, paper types and this. That. And it is important, you know, to, to be clear, it is important to get the right the right print and the right paper, but the, the framing can make or break an image. And I've seen so many pictures where someone spent loads of money on the camera and then they've taken a great picture and they've invested all this time and thought into it and then they've put and before anyone kills me if you've put an ikea frame on something we all have so you know i'm sure you have but <laughs> but uh but they'll but they'll put a they'll put a cheap ikea frame on it now if it's the right color that's all right but more importantly um i see so many pictures where people putting the wrong color frames on stuff and it just ruins the picture completely. Mm. Mm. That go for mount board as well. Do you use different kind uh, of mount boards to Yes. I oh, tend to I tend to steer clear of the sort of out there ones. I mean, you can get some really sort of funky coloured ones, but uh, I mean, I tend to stick to two. Mine are pretty simple. They're either uh, sort of slightly off white. Uh, that's the sort of one that gets used on maybe sort of. 80 percent this stuff and then if you're doing anything sort of uh like high key black and white or something really sort of punchy like that uh i might go for a really sort of what's well, called ice white just a just a pure sort of brilliant white uh for those ones but uh, I, t I tend to steer clear of the ones where you've got like um they've got like black trims on them and stuff like that i tend to sort of avoid them they look a little bit dated i would say but uh but yeah, just generally the two colours for the for the mounts. But I would say the frame finish is is absolute. I mean, I've it's been a real eye opener for me because when I first opened that gallery, I was tending to sort of stick to just two types of frames. I was either framing everything in uh, like a light oak, or everything in everything else in black, and nothing in between. And what I found as I went along and sort of working with a, a local framer is you know become really good friends with actually and he really knows his stuff he used to actually frame for colin prior many years ago it's just, he's such a daft lad because uh you know i said to him he, he said oh i used to frame for this scotch bloke colin something or other I said, colin prior <laughs> and he oh, yeah that's him i didn't even know who it was <laughs> but uh but yeah he's an absolute master at sort of picking the right frame finish for the right image and he'll pick he'll fish stuff out off the walls that I would never have picked out myself, but mm. when we, we sort of put them down on the table and have a look at them, they, they really work, you know. So it's, I would say to anyone, if, you, you know, if you're going about framing your images, it's well worth the time going to a you know, really experienced framer and sort of talking through the process with them because uh, you know, it really can make or break an image, I would say. But isn't the frame choice determined by the colour preference that 
the other half prefers and the room that it's going in <laughs> and the paint scheme and the colour scheme true. that's in that there. Is true, yeah. Irrespective yeah. of whether you think that it matches the print perfectly and brings out the textures oh, yeah. and the colours, if oh, it doesn't yeah. go in the room, we're not having it. <laughs> this, this has happened to you, Jay, isn't it? You're speaking from experience <laughs> here, aren't you? That's so not a on, hypothetical what question your, there. What, what happened to your picture then, go on? No, no, nothing's happened. No, no, I'm, I'm currently... No, what, what, what frame was it? No, I'm currently in the in the process of, of... I'm going to be decorating this room that I'm in at the moment. And obviously my objective is to put a lot of my prints on the wall. But there's a current debate going on around the, the choice of frame colours and making sure that it's matching the the colours we're having in here now. We're going to probably go for a nice plain white wall to make it nice and simple. Um, but I know that I'm just sort of throwing it out there as something that I know can be very contentious. And I'm sure you must have experienced it in the gallery about people oh, that yeah. just purely want the, the picture on the basis that the frame matches the room they're putting it in. Yeah, yeah. Uh, everything on the walls in the gallery that I have, uh, uh, the frame has obviously been chosen for the picture, for the, you mm. know, for the image. But you'll get many times people will come in and they'll they'll see a picture. I've had it a few times where someone's picked a really sort of um, a sort of classic sort of landscape sort of scene, you know, bright, vibrant colours, that sort of thing, blue sky, whatever. And uh, they tend to go well with quite sort of light. Um, well, the, the ones I use tend to be sort of oak frame finishes or uh, beach finishes. Um, but light and airy sort of frame finishes, if you like, and they'll come in and they'll go, "I want a, I want a dark grey frame on that," and you'll and you'll think, "That's not going to work on a dark grey frame," but they're insistent on it, and it's you know you've just got to give people what they want, obviously. So it's no problem. I mean, you know, a lot of the stuff will come out of the frame and go and get reframed or whatever. But uh, but yeah, people do frame for the colour of the couch or you know. I, I would charge them more for that sort of thing. Because they've ruined the picture, oh yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'd lob 50% on straight away. That'll teach so, you. So in know. your gallery, Stu, you've got, what, you've got a selection of frames as well, have you? Like yeah. Where so you what, can, and then you'll send it all away to be done. Yeah, so you've got the stuff on the walls and then I've got two or three sort of sample boards where the, my frame has sort of made made me up like a, it's like a thin uh, bit of foam X with, that I can stick them to. Yeah. And uh, yeah, there's maybe another, I don't know, 15, 20 different frame finishes and different thicknesses. So they can sort of pick one off the wall and sort of, you know, put it up against the picture and yeah. see, get a rough idea what it's going to look like. And then, mm. you know, I always give people the, you know, people have got the option if they want to, if they want to swap it out for a different one, they can do. But, uh, you know, it takes a little bit of time, obviously, but it's, it's no problem. Do you shoot standard sizes? So, be, yeah, do you shoot standard sizes, or do you shoot? Do you, because I would, I, I'm really interested to know this for someone who frames every, every, a lot of things they do. Do you go off? Oh, I need to be thinking that I've got to shoot this four by five or sixteen by nine or whatever. Because yeah, I'll, yeah, you do. Ah, okay. A lot. Of, well, a lot. I think I said earlier, a lot of people want panoramic images, yeah. and I've had to sort of train myself to sort of when I when I go out shooting now. I'm always, if possible, looking for a panoramic image on top of anything else I shoot. Because, um, yeah, people just want wall. Uh, the, the, a lot of people are used to sort of going... I don't want to use the I, Ikea reference again, but people are, are used to sort of going into places like Ikea and seeing big, big mm. wide canvases. And that's their sort of, uh, sort of preconceived idea of what they want on the wall. Whereas for photographers, we're just obviously just shooting for the image so you'll shoot in three by two or four by five yeah. um the ones that sell the least which um you, you'd su probably surprise a lot of photographers sort of portrait format um i mean i've certainly in the last two, two or three years i i tend to sort of see a lot in portrait um because i find it easier to sort of exclude elements in the frame especially if you're shooting wide uh but portrait frames uh Portrait format images are really quite hard to, to shift in the gallery because, as I say, they don't really fit fill walls, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you go out and you're you're out taking your photos, are you primarily going out to take photos for the gallery or are you primarily going out to take photos for yourself? And I know that must be really difficult because if you're 
working you know it's your living at the end of the day and you're trying to find stuff that sells but how do you how do you put that against you know sort of what you your creative you know sort of instincts do you know what i mean yeah yeah well what i what i've learned to do over time that i think sort of works best for me is that i try to sort of separate the the two approaches so i've I tend to either go out specifically to shoot images for the gallery or I go out specifically to go and shoot for myself, um, which is further complicated, obviously, by doing these logs now. So it's uh, yeah. it's it's quite tricky to sort of juggle them a little bit. But um, certainly when I first opened, I had a, a massive long list of places that I needed to, to get images for that shop because if I didn't, the shop wouldn't survive. You, you have to have a sort of stock sort of library of maybe 20, 25 classic viewpoints that people will go to and visit because they want their own version of it. Um, and over time, I've sort of gradually ticked those off and I don't really need to go back and reshoot them anytime soon. So I, I'm slowly beginning to go back towards shooting more for myself now because the sort of pressure of getting those images that I needed for the shop has sort of lessened a little bit. Um, but yeah, I mean, still shooting for the gallery, I, I tend to try and sort of separate the two a little bit because it just takes the pressure off. Because if you, you know, you go out and you've got some amazing conditions and you and you just want to just take pictures here, there and everywhere because they, they grab you. Um, the last thing you want to be thinking about is, well, I really need this particular shot yeah. in this light at this angle because you just get sidetracked to be honest so moving on um let's now talk about we were gonna did we, did we say we were gonna do this last week i don't think we did did we we're gonna share our favorite black and white images um because obviously you know i think should we go first with you james because i know you're um you're... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we know james james is never organized is he i know he was on he was on a bit late but even still haven't gotten sorted so who yeah, wants to go yeah, first who wants to it. share that how about you darren do you fancy going first well i can do well this is uh, it's really difficult to pick uh, a favorite but I, what i want to do was show you uh, the same image but process slightly different so let me share yeah so i always i must i i love black and white images i really do and you know especially because james shoots a lot of them i'm always commenting on on james's videos you know when he shoots a, a, a lovely black and white and I do, I do think the mountains um screen black and white to me oh, sometimes you know mm. uh so this was a, a an image that I, I took the other day down by the river mm. when it was very foggy and straight away i just thought you're right you know it's, i'm gonna do black and white because i actually turned my camera to, to monochrome that day on the back of the lcd so i could shoot everything purposely in black and white and as soon as i did it um or as soon as i processed it i thought oh, i'll just have a little play around here a little bit of split toning and i really like the split toning image as well but i know i don't know if this kind of split toning is unique to me so the reason i've shared this image this image or these two images is to find out what you think of the two variations I prefer the black and white. I'm not sure. Honesty. I'm not sure because I think to create the right mood at the right time, because assuming it's it's early morning, is it not? Early morning. Yeah, we, you can see. You, I mean, you can see that, obviously the, the sun. sun. The sun's just just yeah. risen. Uh, probably about an hour after sunrise, I'm guessing. Yeah, I'm going. Was the there any colour in the sky, Darren? Um, it, I, I would say it was probably a mixture of the two. You know, so it wasn't it's, as bright as the split tone, but it obviously it wasn't as flat as the black it's and white. It's definitely monochrome, but I'd I'd go for the sepia because it brings in the morning mood for me. What the what the the, the one that split tone in the split tone, in, yeah, yeah, yeah. So which is again, I, I'm always drawn to sepia, so that is almost a, a, has got a sepia feel. It's almost to it. there, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I like the sepia. I like that sepia as well. I yeah. I would possibly say i'd like the sepia but maybe knock the sepia back a little bit just a little bit because I, right. I do think it's maybe a little bit overpowering but um 
but I think I prefer the sepia one over the black and white. Do you? Well, that's really interesting, actually. Well, Anybody same as what else? James was saying, because it's obviously early morning. I can imagine that sort of, I don't know what ex exactly it was like, but a sort of slight warm haze mm. to it, I would imagine. And, yeah. Uh, the sort of yellowish tones in it kind of kind of suit that, I think. Well, I get, your, I get your point, actually, about that, but it does look more morningly, more morningly, morning-like. The, the black and white one looks almost silver. To me, that looks like a moon reflection. And actually, that's why I quite like it, because it kind of looks a little bit more... It probably doesn't reflect at all the, the time of day you're out there and what what you're trying to convey, but it looks more... It looks like a nighttime shot, yeah. Yeah. But you won't get a bird flying at night. Unless it's an owl. <laughs> I always... I, I, I love a, a sepia image, and I don't know if sepia is now very dated and I'm just showing my age, and that's when I, when I do it, I think, well, have I just ruined that image by by turning it you know sepia should i have really stuck to to black and white so yeah so thank you gentlemen for i think they both input. work darren as, yeah. as your answer i think they both work so it's down yeah. to you know what you prefer they they definitely have, a, have both got a lot going for them in different ways haven't they it's interesting talking about you saying that you know is it dated and etc just shoot if you like it just keep it, it you know it doesn't mm. it it shouldn't matter what whether whether it's dated or a trend or whatever, it's what you feel at the time you mm. enjoyed, you know. So if you enjoyed processing like that, then you know, keep it definitely. I wonder if it'd work better if you take the bird out the lower part. I've got um, I've got an image. Well, I, I obviously I took it with the bird in, or there was a load of birds flying kind of through, and that happened to get that particular shot. But then I did wait for them to pass and took the image. So it's clean. It, it it was void of all birds as well. So it definitely is um, a bird, isn't it? But I think the the upper bird works. Definitely. Oh, what? Take take it out of the water. Take, take the, the one out of the water. Yeah, because it's not quite symmetrical. Um, it's not quite symmetrical, is it? It's got. It's like you've got a reflection of the sun in the bottom half. More detail. Mm. And it's more contrast here as opposed to the upper. Shit, my camera's just falling off. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Just knock myself out. Right. I, I know where where you're coming from a little bit, James. I think that that it, the bird at the bottom kind of just pulls your eye to the bottom a little bit. It does. Bit. Right, a bit okay. unbalanced for me, but oh my lovely God. image though. Lovely. It image. is. Right. Yeah. Thank you, gentlemen. Image. I'll stop sharing. My favourite set. Is it? Okay. Who 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 fancies going next? Who wants to? Does anybody want to share next? I'll go next if you want. Go on then. I think my favourite black and white image I haven't actually taken yet. <laughs> and that's because I've got in my mind a vision of a black and white image I want to take in the fens. Uh, and I think the fens lends itself to really moody, dark, bleak black and white images. And I, what I want to get in my mind is I've, I've got this vision of a, a sort of a derelict fen building in the middle of the flat fens on a really foggy, misty, moody morning and turning that black and white. So my black and white image that I would be sharing is my best ever I haven't <laughs> taken, but it's in my mind anyway. So what I'm going to choose... <coughs> That's So the, the one I'm going to choose is, and, and given we've got uh, our Lake District friend with us, is, ah, right. is this that one... Rydal? <coughs> it is Rydal, yeah, that oh, I took okay. last year at Rydal. Um, this was... Um, yeah, it was a. There was a, a lot of low lying cloud this morning, and <clears throat> this was at Rider Water. And I took several at Rider Water. I took some color versions of this, but when I when I did the mono conversion of this, I just felt that this one worked really well. Um, you know, you've got a lot of mood and atmosphere in this shot, and um, you know there was the light on this copse of trees. And yeah, I just I just really like it. I just really like it as a mono shot. I just think it. Personally, I just think it works because it's got a lot of moon. And I think that's with black and whites. I think, you you know, in my mind, black and whites convey a lot of mood. You know, that's what the, what you can do with a black and white. You can bring out mood and atmosphere. Um, and, yeah, and I think that's... There's an air of infrared about it. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Did, no, you, did really... you see it as black and white when you shot it? Or was it one of those where you, you sort of converted it afterwards and... 
felt I'll be honest. Liked. No, I'll be honest. And I converted it afterwards and liked it. I thought, you know, there was, I took a panoramic of this uh, in this position as well, wider, much wider shot because you've got um, you, the low lying cloud was really down above. I don't know what this fell is behind. You'll know, Stu, behind this. Um, uh, is it Nab, Nabscar? Nab, is it Nabscar? Yeah. Yeah. So you, you could hardly see any of Nabscar at all. So, and you, and it was as still as anything. Uh, as you can see, so there was a really nice reflection. So the panorama I took was literally just of the uh, the, the strip through the middle with the cops of the trees that you can see either yep. side, and it worked really well. And that's what I first saw was the opportunity to take that panorama with with sort of a nothing at the top and a nothing at the bottom and just a strip in the middle. And then when I, I looked a little bit closely and saw this cops in the middle and, and I saw the light, I suppose obviously that's why I turned it, mono because I could see there was some contrast there in that light around the trees in the back and the little bit of light at the top and I thought well you know that's going to really, really work, work as a mono, as a mono. Um, yeah. which yeah. is which why is I turned it that way, way. But yeah, yeah, no, no I, quite I quite like this one. So, I love it. I love it. Love it. It's, love it. it's a cracking image. Cracking image that, mate. Well done, well done. It's really subtle as well. The, the, the blacks are, are lifted, aren't they? You've lifted the blacks all the way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, really yeah so it is, it is a quick question. While we've got Stu here, if you was to print that image, Stu, what paper mm. would you use for that? Well, it, it's it's quite a soft black and white, isn't it? It's it's uh, it's not got okay. really deep black. So mm. I, I I would I don't know. You tend to use burritos for a lot of black and whites, but I'm not yeah. sure I would on this. I think I'd use maybe something like a. I don't know, like a cotton etching or a, an NST, so something with a little bit of uh, texture in it, just to sort of. Any time you've got really sort of fine detail in an image like this one, with you know, with the foliage, uh, yeah. a paper with a little bit of texture tends to sort of bring that out. Just a to bit bring better. out this area mm -hmm. around the trees, a little bit of light on the yeah. trees. Yeah, yeah. So any, that's any... really interesting because I straight away I would have picked a burrito for this paper. I, I, w I wouldn't have even questioned it. I would have gone yeah. straight to. Yeah, for my for my limited yeah. knowledge, so it's that's why I asked you because that's really interesting to find out. What I mean, there's you would no pick. there's no right or wrong with that, but uh, I mean, f from my own point of view, when I'm printing black and white, if if I'm using a burrito, it tends to be the ones that have got a, a bit more punch in them. Uh, right. Okay. Thank you. Interesting. Well that's done, me. mate. Excellent. Dave, do you want to go, Dave? I don't shoot black and white. I haven't got any. <laughs> Have you not? Have you not got anything? No, I, I, I have actually. Quickly, convert one. I did. That's exactly <laughs> what I did because I, I got some black and white from a street shoot I did in London, but I wouldn't class any of them as a favourite image. So what I did was I took an image that uh, I quite liked. Can you see that? Oh, Ooh, the chair yeah, you yeah, see. Yeah, that works. Yeah. Well. That's those. So yeah. I, I dropped it into Photoshop, did a straight black and white layer, and then uh, a curves adjustment to crank the blacks really intense in the sea in that mid-ground. Uh, I like that I mean, zigzag you, you've got there. It's you nice. couldn't have got a better wave, could you? No, you actually, I didn't have to wait long because they were happening all the time. You, you've got a causeway just under that bit of wave, and they come in from both sides alternately. So as the, they come up over the causeway, you get this zigzag effect all the time, and it's just a matter of shooting several and get the best one, the clearest line on it. So, uh, yeah, but it, it was... Um, it, it, I, I never saw it as a black and white shot. It, it, it has got colour in it, the original, but I think it does work as a black and white, and if I was into mono photography, that would be the sort of thing that I would do. I think it's great, Dave, as black and white the 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 yeah, foreground the the in the sort of lower third that's brilliant that detail in there i love that i really do it's, it's fantastic as a black and white i might uh i might just stick it on my page then on that basis i, I just don't see in black and white so I, I don't really know much about it so i i you know i i like to kind of stick to what i know uh, and uh, I've never really worked well with black and white, but if you think that works, then happy days. I, I think you could add a bit more punch to it. If I'm honest, a bit more dodging and burning, bring those waves out. Actually, waves, okay. definitely. Definitely for me, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I literally took about 30 seconds on it before we started recording, so what I'll do is I'll revisit it <laughs> with a little more thought and see what I can come up with. 
Yeah, I see what James is saying on that sort of that row of the waves in the middle. You could punch the whites up on that or, or yeah, dodge a bird on those blocks. whites just to really yeah. make those those lift a bit further. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I'll give that a but, go. But the composition Thanks. is fantastic, isn't it, with that with yeah. the way the zigzags run up to the uh, church? I, I've, I don't... I mean, it's, I'm maybe being incredibly ignorant. I don't think I've actually seen that zigzag composition on that uh, shot of the church before. Is it, is it common, that sort of type of shot with the zigzag or not? No, it, it's a particular set of circumstances. You've got a, a big swell uh, yeah. with with a high spring tide uh, yeah. and a, a, a southwester pushing the, the sea up as well. So um, other, other than that, it tends to be much more muted. You don't get such sharp uh, breakers. I tend to, whenever I see that scene, it... it a lot of people tend to just do the sort of long exposure version of it. Do you know what I mean? But yeah, uh, local knowledge. Mm. You'd totally lost, wouldn't it, Mark, if you did that long exposure? Oh yeah, mm. ruin it. Mm. Yeah, I've I've shot long exposures on a lovely summer's evening and turned it into a tranquil scene. But th this was uh, I could barely stand up when I was shooting this. Yeah, a lot of drama. That's what black and white does in a way, isn't it? It's yeah, a added emotion drama. Oh, maybe I'll, you know, think more about it when, when the conditions are right. I mean, it's certainly a bit of a hole in my skill set at the moment. It's really good, that, Dave, I've got to say. Well done, Dave. Cheers, boys. Yeah. OK. Uh, Stuart, do you fancy sharing as the guest? Yeah, go on, yeah. then I'll do mine, yeah. This all might surprise you, this, I don't know, this, this image. Um, I'll just get it on the screen here, just a sec. Uh, there we go. Uh, yeah, this is my favourite black and white image. Um, not a lake, not a Lake District picture at all, really. Uh, it's probably not in terms of my sort of uh, maybe best image in terms of black and white. I don't know, but it, it's certainly my favourite image because it took me an absolute age to get this picture. It's my village jetty where I live here, okay. and. Uh, yeah, and it's it's one of those where we don't really get sea fog very often here. And when we do, I always sort of looked at this jetty and thought that'll look really good in a, in a thick fog. And the problem I always had was that the fog would always come in on a day that either I was at work or um, it would be combined with the wrong tide because you need a a really high tide for this to work so this is this is a really ultra long exposure i think i took this with like the 15 stop or something like that okay. um but yeah basically it's just the jetty going off into nothing with the uh with the sea fog there and I, in terms of processing it i've not really done a massive amount i've sort of Anywhere in the sort of sea where there was a hint of texture, I've just sort of taken it out using sort of radial uh, filters, just dragging the uh, clarity down negatively and the texture down negatively. But uh, but yeah, this is my favourite one, just purely because it took me ages to get. I think probably about four years. And that sort of uh, rickety old signpost on on the end of the jetty sadly that's no longer now and that was the one thing that gave this jetty loads and loads of character um and now because it's down i've just i've absolutely no interest in shooting this jetty now <laughs> so it's just a, a jetty with nothing on the end of it so it doesn't really have any character anymore but uh but yeah this is this is probably my favorite black and white i don't i don't do a massive amount of black and white um certainly not as much as I used to really because obviously with running the gallery there's a don't sell don't they sell yeah they, they don't yeah nah. they, it's it's surprising it's still I mean for photo for photographers I mean we're shooting black and white all the time but for non photographers and sort of people coming out in there as just sort of uh, tourists or whatever the, the there's still a, a a sort of mindset out there that black and white is still actually quite niche which sounds ridiculous because it's not but to the to the general public black and white is still quite an acquired taste so i've got to be very careful with black and white images in there I, I only put maybe one or two up just to sort of break up the rest of them a little bit i have actually sold a couple of these in the gallery before but the the one of those where you know you just sort of put them up and 
don't really have any ex- any expectation mm. with it, should we say. You said it took you four years to get that? Yeah, because it was just the, the combination of just different factors constantly sort of eluding us. I'd, I'd either be on the wrong shift at work or, you know, the, the I'd get the mist, but the, it would be a low tide, so, the, you know, it, it just doesn't work with without a high tide. So the, that shot there, I mean, I don't know if you can maybe see just in the very bottom left... Uh, just next to the jetty, you can actually see a tiny little bit of the seabed poking through. Yeah, but uh, yeah, just you, you know yourself. You know, you, you'll have a scene in your mind that you sort of visualise, and you know you wait forever and ever and ever for the conditions to land. And you know, fortunately, this time. It did. Well, some of us, like Jamie, still haven't taken it. Don't we, Jamie? No, <laughs> still to come. <laughs> come back to us, Jay, when you've got one. What time? <laughs> <laughs> Episode 433, I'll have a black and white one. <laughs> I do like this, though. This is my type. I'd, I'd love to do more of this minimalist black and white stuff. I really, it's very I really McKenna do. I style. love the simplicity of it. Thank I really you. do. Yeah. yeah. I, I took some stuff at Rutland Water, not far from me, a sort of the, the church there. Uh, it is a, a, a simple, minimal black and white. And I, and I just really enjoy that sort of stuff. I can't, I haven't got the. the you know the the types of places to go. I don't think around here to get them, but I just really enjoy looking at them. Is it Jack Appleton lives at nor around Norfolk Way? He, he, oh, he, takes he does some brilliant stuff. Really he nice, does, yeah. Black and white stuff. Brilliant stuff, yeah. Yeah. You just need to pop over to Dave's jetty. You'd be fine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Practice. <laughs> yeah, I've got to get one of them little triangular what's it. <laughs> yes. Right. Stu, where is where is this? Is this Orbiston then? Looking at what? No, C scale. Seascale, right? Yeah, I live at Seascale, yeah. So I'm, I'm sort of 10 minutes from Wasdale. What a shame. I know. <laughs> I, do, I, know. I do feel for you. It's a right bugger. It must be hard. <laughs> sure. Right, I'll just pull that off. There you go. Well done, Stu. All right, I'll, I'll go now and save you, James, and then you can go last, yeah? Okay, all right, all right I'll let you off. All right, so. so this is one, I've got two, actually. Um... Oh. Yeah, I know, but it, I'm only going to do this one very quickly, this first one, very briefly. Um, this is, I, I thought I'd better put a landscape one in, otherwise, uh, you know, people might be wondering what, what's going on. So this is my first one. You have to forgive me while I just go full screen on it. So uh, th- th- this that's is... The, that's the roaches, isn't it? Yeah, yeah there's the roaches, and it. It, it's a very quick one, and the reason I put this one in is because I felt, I felt that with Stuart here, I had to put a, a landscape one in. Um <laughs> This is a. This is actually. I never envisaged this at all as being black and white. I literally took this in colour, and then I think sometime in lockdown last year, I just went through all of my old images and converted this one over to black and white. And it actually, probably looks better black and white than it does in colour. So yeah, I've yeah. got an image actually very similar to that. And uh, yeah, mine's colour. That's a good yeah. shirt. I might have a look. Yeah. Have a little tickle around my mind. Uh, let's be honest. I think everyone's probably got. <laughs> if they've been up the roaches, everyone's got an image similar to that. It's the one you grab. I've take. never been to the Peak District. Have you not? <laughs> no. <laughs> it's not the most flattering place, in my opinion. Yeah, there's, there's two of them either. I'd say there's three or four places in the Peak District that are, that are good, but mainly you. It's not like the lakes or Snowdonia where you you know you drive around and you see stuff. It's sort of like you have got to go to these specific places to get the mm. shots. But um, yeah, that's that's that one anyway. I only wanted to put that one up quickly. And the other one, <laughs> um, which is my favourite black and white, and it took me ages to oh, to yeah. work this out. Oh, but yeah. I've just gone for a. a Nice. I like that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, nice. I like yeah. that. Yeah. I've just gone for a, a nice shape, symmetry. Yeah. yeah. I just. Do you know what this is? This is a, in the Tate, uh, taken in the Tate Modern, and I just saw this girl. She's sitting. This this bit up in the top left hand corner is some sort of um, projection that they're they're showing something there, and she was watching that. But I just really like the way the light was falling on her. Falls on her face. Yeah, and I felt like it's got a bit of an emotion. It's, it's, it's a bit. She looks a bit vulnerable with the pose that yeah. she's sitting in, and that's what drew me like to that. take that shot. I really like that. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. That, that's um, mm. yeah. And I, I, there, there were loads of street shots I've taken in black and white that I could have picked really, but I just felt this one is probably the one that when I got it home. I went wow, that, and it's exactly what I intended. I, I took that shot right. looking at her. <clears throat> Sorry, I don't know if it's my eyes go or the computer, but is that? Is that image 
a little bit noisy. Yeah, very noisy. Yeah, because I was gonna say because yeah. that it I, works I well. love that. It works, I, yeah. Yeah. I, I love the noise yeah. in yeah. that image. Oh. I'm, look, I'm looking past her yeah. onto the wall at the back. You know, yeah. where, you know I've actually added that. Like, I've I've added extra grain in. Did you? Yeah, in Lightroom yeah. because I just think that looks great. Though. Yeah, I feel it's. It, it, I wanted it to look almost like a film yeah, shot, yeah. sort yeah. of gritty and because a lot of street is, yeah, a lot of street is gritty and and sort yeah, of yeah. like yeah. that. And yeah, and I, I'm not scared of doing that at all with my, you know, I'll push it to the to the limit on my street shots because I think that it's fine putting a bit of sort of grittiness in. So, so yeah, yeah, yeah. so that's it. And and that, that, like I said, that shot was I literally when I when I looked through the viewfinder. That's what I felt. Her, I felt her vulnerability, and that's like it almost it was a light bulb moment for me when I sort of went, okay, that's what I'm. That's what photography is about. It's about you know getting that emotion into a shot, and I and I kind that's of that's the battle, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, that's the battle. Yeah, <coughs> and I, I kind of felt that right there. So you just took the one shot, Gary, over a series of. I think that was literally the one shot. Yeah, I think right. literally I walked in because obviously. She wasn't moving then, obviously. No, no. she was just sat watching that. And yeah. I think if I'd have taken more than one shot, because I didn't have silent shutter, she'd have looked around and sort of, you know, what are you up to type thing, why are you taking a shot at me? And yeah. I literally, I walked mm. in, saw her sat oh, yeah. there, took that one shot and almost walked away, you know, before before she could look around and say, oi, what are you taking my shot for? Yeah, mm. not that I ever I'm just, I'm just glad her dad wasn't watching your time. <laughs> <laughs> She's a dirty old man. She's not that. She's not that young. She's about nineteen twenty. I think. Oh no! She's, no, she's not. She's. A, she. She. I think she. She was some sort of student or something. She was. Not, she's not a kid. Honest. Oh. Anyway, yeah. Very good. That. Thank you. Very good. Yeah. So James, we just we just left with you. Yeah. Um. The grand finale. Uh, I don't know. So I shoot. I do shoot a lot of black and white. Um. My favorite. I'm not sure about my favorite. This is my. Favorite recent one uh, taken last year. Can you see that? Oh, yeah. oh I know that one for you. Well, yeah. you see that? Yeah. Okay, so this is where is it, Stu? Uh, it's Red Pike. Come on, it is Red Pike. Yeah, uh, that is a Red Pike taken from uh, Scott Fell. Oh, Scott sorry. Fell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Aye. Yeah. That is on Red Pike. Yeah. Yeah. Um. And that sees Scarfell runs behind. And this was a handheld shot. Uh, literally, the light on the top there, on the right hand side, it just went in a matter of seconds. Uh, and I just love the diag diagonals in this and the shadow which the light has created. Uh, I like the tonal range. Um, processed, I've done a lot of um, uh, radial filter, just a give it extra punch yeah. for the um, lighted area. And if you've seen the, the background, middle ground, there is a group of... I was going to say, it's a group of walkers. People that, it? yeah. Group of walkers, whatever yeah. you want to call is them, just to give it some yeah, added yeah. scale. <clears throat> yeah. Um, oh, yeah. So there you go, oh. yeah. I love the light on that. I love the way the light's falling on that. It's fantastic. I remember yeah. saying to you when you took the shot how much I liked it. Mm. You did can you good, zoom yeah. in, yeah. James, on the walkers? I ain't got my glasses. Say again. Can you zoom in on the um, top right? There you go. Oh yeah. Mm. That? Yeah. Better, what what time of year was it, James? What September? Uh, September. Oh, right. September. Yeah. Just before lockdown. <sighs> Bittersweet. Yeah. Uh, F, F11. What, what was the what was the conditions like, James? Outside, w was this always going to be a black and white for you, or because obviously you? What, what was the colours like in the scene that you saw? Was it good enough? It wasn't. It didn't work in colour. Put it one way: the, the colours didn't add to the image. Mm. The reason I went for a black and white is purely because of that light. Yeah, that light, and I wanted to bring out the contrast. And I think the only way to do that. It's to convert to a black and white. As I said before, I love the blacks in the shadow in contrast with that, that splash of light as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, fleeting, just a fleeting shot handheld, as I said, and I think it, it works well. Yeah. 
Well, I very much hope that you enjoyed that and hopefully part two will be out sometime during the week. So thanks very much for watching and goodbye.